let's go and get this thing going. Did you, well, you know, let, let's, let's kick this off a little bit. Um, so my name is uh, Tony Lupo. I'm here with uh, Ryan Fairfield and Michael, Michael uh, what's your last name? Michael Strack. Uh, today's date is uh, February, what is it, the 18th? The 18th. 2022. All day. All day. And all day. And, yeah. and we're here in, in Collinsville, Oklahoma with Marta. And what's your last name, Marta? One. Uh oh. Water. Okay. W A R N E R. Cool. And um, so you grew up in, 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 in Europe, in Germany, was it? Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about where you were born and what it was like growing up there as a child? I was born in 1931. So I was in the perfect time period to be totally educated by Adolf Hitler that is mm -hmm. um, my starting school six years old the first half of that school year we had a teacher I always remember her because she was tall handsome and she wore Florentine hats those wide brimmed hats and dresses all the way down to the ankle. I always remember that. And she'd come in and she'd say, good morning, children, let us pray. Mm. So here comes the first big vacation, the summer vacation. And when we came back to school, we didn't have that teacher anymore. Mm. Our new teacher was a young woman and it was Heil Hitler. Oh. There was no more let us pray, it was Heil Hitler, mm -hmm. and that was the start. Do you remember, like, what grade or year this was? First grade. So it was, would have been nineteen. I w uh, huh? So you remember what year it was when they when you saw this this transition? Thirty seven. Nineteen thirty seven. Yeah. Okay. You know, the first half of the school year I was six years old, so six and a half. Mm -hmm. So nineteen thirty seven. So how did the kids respond to this very abrupt? shift how can you respond when you're six years old yeah you don't you do as you're told mm -hmm. there is no oh wow you know that was different it was new it was interesting and it was school mm -hmm. how do you expect uh, i mean little kids mm -hmm. they do as they're told mm -hmm. most of them most <laughs> of the time <laughs> okay so, the teaching went relatively normal. You know, one and one equals two, and two and two equals four, that doesn't change. Mm -hmm. No matter what the <laughs> now, government power? is, that always stays the same, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, geography stays the same. You are not going to change the continents on this planet. What does change is history. Because history is something that is used politically. Of course, you don't know that when you're six, seven, eight, nine years old. You learn what they teach you. However, in our house at home, my father was a reader. And he taught me how to read very early so I could read before I started school. And I was reading books. <laughs> so unfortunately, in history, my hand would always go up. Mm. Because what I had read and what they were saying were always two different things. Mm -hmm. Well, in grade school, that wasn't big at all at that particular point in time. I was too little. You know, I ta they taught, I, be I learned. I, when I fourth, was in fourth grade, we got a visit from a school superintendent. And he was examining the children. And at that time in Germany, 
if you went to higher education, fifth grade was the first year of higher education. Hmm. And for that, you had to have a certain IQ. Hmm. So here this guy comes and he is doing his, whatever it is he's doing, and he's selecting four girls, one of which is me. And one of the other one was Renate, Elfriede, myself, and Erika. Hmm. We're all girls. And we are selected for higher education. Well, at that point in time in Germany, that cost money. It wasn't free. What's free in life anyways? <laughs> but in any case, my father is, oh man, he doesn't like to hear that at all. After all, we are talking in the 1930s. I'm a girl. What am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to get married and have babies. <laughs> What's with higher education here? So he has a fit and he gets a letter and he's told by the government, the way it works is he pays and if he cannot afford it, the government will pay. However, he does not have any choice in his daughter's education. Mm -hmm. The government has made that choice for him. Wow. So, if I understand you correctly, at this point, the government was like cultivating students and dictating what path they were going on to help the government, and the parents didn't have much say in it. Correct. Wow. The parents had no say in it. None. Hmm. Period. Hmm. Silge. So my father was upset, I think, is not a word to really... <laughs> He's really upset. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> However, he had no choice. Yeah. At the time, my parents had a grocery store. And my father worked, my mother ran the store. So they were told that they had to join the party. And seeing that the store was under my mother's name, my mother had to join the party or else the store would be closed. Hmm. Hmm. So she did as she was told. She said, yes, so the store stayed open. Mm -hmm. It was easy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that was their their sense of that was where their um that was your money coming from. In in what city or town was all this occurring in? Where were you living at the time? Frankfurt. In Frankfurt. Yeah, yeah. a suburb of Frankfurt mm -hmm. uh, in West Germany. Yeah. In, uh, well, it's what became West Fra Germany. It's Frankfurt a mine on the Main River because there are two. There is also one in the eastern section that's on the Oder. The Oder River. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, now you do. Yeah. So, <laughs> That's why we're here. <laughs> so there's Frankfurt a mine, okay, which is it's pretty much in, at the time, the Western, it's not, it's pretty much center. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my mother, my mother had her store and she did as she was told. And I got to go to high school because my father had no choice in the matter. Totally. So now we're in, we're in, high, in high school. Mind you, I'm 10 years old. I have to go by streetcar and by bus into the center of town as a 10-year-old little kid. American, <laughs> Americans, I think nowadays have no concept of sending their kid mm -hmm. by public transportation from point A to point B. Yes. Took about an hour and a half to get to school. I had to be in school at seven because from seven to eight, we were standing in the schoolyard with our right arm up and the hands out with a high DMC, excuse the language. Fine. Okay, 
and listening out to all the latest news and how good Germans were, how good the soldiers were, how wonderful we were winning, winning what? Okay? So here we are, all in order, like we're supposed to be, by classroom, you know, like little soldiers, yeah. <laughs> all standing around the stupid flag. <laughs> Did, I mean, we're, we're... I'm sorry, I'm laughing, but thinking back, how ridiculous it all appears to the adult mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, however, we were trained. We were little kids and we were trained at that point and we did as we were told. So we stand, you know, until 8 o'clock or 7.35 or whatever before we get into the classroom. Then we have our, our lessons. Um, everything went fine except history. Hmm. That was always a problem because what I had read and was reading at home did not even coincide in the least bit of what we were being told. Mm. So here our scan comes up and then I went out in front of the classroom, out the door, and I stood there for the next 15 minutes or so for punishment. Because you were questioning their version that they were talking, teaching you? Exactly. I was challenging. I wasn't questioning. I was challenging. Mm -hmm. And that didn't work so good. <laughs> so I was a lot in front of the door. Yeah. Um, and then started the bombings. Mm. And with that, The government decided that the children needed to be protected. So we were not going to stay in those towns. Mm -hmm. And they sent us into the villages someplace. Mm -hmm. And our classroom was sent to a little village called, called Burggemünden, which was in Vogelsberg. Mind you, at this point in time now, a lot of, most, the majority of the men are playing soldiers someplace. So the villages are minus manpower. So they send us kids into the villages and we could pick the potatoes out of the field. You know what I mean? They got free labor. <laughs> At that point in time, being in the, in a village was good because there was food. Mm -hmm. You know, things changed. Um, while I was in Burggemünden, one day I got sick, really sick. And there was no doctor in that village. There was a doctor in the village Niedergemünden, which was several kilometers away. And I really got sick. And my teacher put me on her bicycle and took me <laughs> to the next village where there was a doctor. Well, as it turned out, he did have a telephone and he called Gieson or whatever, but they did come with an ambulance and took me and I had an appendectomy. And during the surgery, in the beginning of that surgery, there was an air raid and I woke up from the anesthesia in an elevator. Oh. And the surgeon was standing next to me and on his hands was a towel. I will always remember that. And the nurse saw me while I was moving and looking. I was going to start talking, I guess. And she 
put the mask back on my face again and dribbled either. So you woke up during the air raid when the procedure during the surgery, during an air raid in, in an elevator. elevator. Oh my, oh my goodness. And she re-anesthetized me. Yeah. And then after that, my mother took me to during for a little bit. And then I had all these belly infections. Mm. Needless to say, and you know, it was a mess. Um, she, my mother had a half sister in Turinga, and eventually, in the process of all of this going on, my father was being trans. Okay, because of his profession and ability, he was not in, not playing soldier. They kept him because he was working in a weapons factory. Okay. So they transferred that particular weapons factory to Silesia, Halba near Sagan in Silesia, which is now Polish, then was German. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, my mother, I was in Burgumünden and my brother was, my father and mother had my brother taken to my mother's half-sister in Thüringen. Hmm. And my mother was traveling from Frankfurt to see her children and her husband all over Germany. So the whole family was broken up. Yes. You were living in a village. Your father was working in a weapons plant. In Silesia, yeah. and my brother was in Turinga, and my mother was in Frankfurt. Wow, my goodness. While she was trying to visit any one of us, there was an attack on the train and she got shot. She got hit. Oh. And she got in a hit in the right arm. And she was eventually taken to Gießen, the first hospital. And they got my father. They wanted to amputate and he refused. Mm. At that I again, you have to remember the time and uh, <coughs> the way society still was, da, 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 da. The husband would not have his wife's arm amputated. Mm. Okay. So they took her from Gießen to to Silesia and she, I'm still in Burschgemünden at that point in time and my brother is still in Thüringen and because of her injury my father then got the authorization to get his children hmm. to where they were and they got what's called, what was called the Helfsheim, which which were checks that were built on the forest edge, hmm. you know, at the edge of the forest. Mm -hmm. There was a little brook. Hmm. That was a nice place, by the way. Hmm. It was a kitchen with two bedrooms. Okay. It was a big kitchen in the middle and a bedroom on each side and an outhouse out there in the woods. Hmm. Okay, now, <laughs> my mother is shot. And as it turned out, she lost the use of, the, of that arm completely. Hmm. 
My father didn't want it amputated. They did, it was long. And eventually her hand was like this, but she could hang a purse on the arm, you know, mm. and it was there. Mm -hmm. But she could never really use it anymore mm. because all of this were gone. So now we are in Silesia. First of all, this is East Germany. It's cold. Don't know anything. At that point in time, we all have, um, what, you, what would you call it in English? Um, rations? Yes. And there was this little restaurant my father would go, would take us, and they'd have a special without coupons mm. for some soup. Mm. I remember that. And I remember this picture and, and the verse that was underneath that picture. And it said, Warum die Betrunkenen schwanken? In English, why drunkens move? <laughs> easy, ganz einfach ist die Geschichte. Easy is the tale. Der Kopf erzeugt große Gedanken. The head develops big thoughts. Und da kriegt er das Übergewicht, so he gets overweight. Mm. I always remember that, you know. So, uh, I had to go to school there. So I had to get on, I had to get on a, to a train, which was about a half an hour walk from where I was to the train station. And then maybe another hour or 45 minute ride in the train to get to school. And where was school at this point? I can't remember. Fair enough. But it took you a while to get there is the bottom line. Yeah. Okay. I didn't like it, but I didn't have any choice. Okay, so we did that. And then, of course, it was middle of the winter, it was freezing. And the little brook was frozen. Mm -hmm. And my brother decided he's gonna get on the ice. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, the ice breaks. Mm -hmm. He's five years younger than I am, all right? so. The ice breaks, the kid gets into the ice cold water and my parents are now upset. Mm. And all the love goes on my brother and I'd like to go up yours, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what can I tell you? I mean, I'm, I'm there too. Yeah. Oh, and there's one other thing about that place. I will always remember because there was no water. Mm. But over at the other edge, a little way away, there was an old farmhouse. Hmm. Now we are in way East Germany or Polish, whatever. Now it's Polish then, okay. And one of the things that I always remember that roof of that house was straw. Hmm. I mean, I come from a city, remember? Yeah. Initially, hmm. originally. So that was something really weird. And in this old farmhouse lived these two old people in this one room together with the chickens and the pig. Hmm. The, this one room, it had a stove in it and it had a bed in it. And I remember the old man sitting at the window using the curtain to wipe his, his knife. <laughs> And the old woman would sweep that floor because, you know, and that was the end of it. Hello there. They had chickens and whatever, but they had a pump outside, water. And my 
parents had made a deal with these people and we were allowed to get the water. So my mother would send me with two buckets, uh, a wooden thing, but you could hang on two buckets to get the water. Hmm. And I'd go to the pump and pump the two buckets and come home with two buckets of water. Hmm. And one day this old lady came to our house and she opened her, she, her, her apron and she had at least a dozen eggs in there she mm. gave to my parents. Mm. I mean, that was, hello! Okay. That was something out of this world and wonderful. So, I remember that, that old lady and that house and that water, getting that water. Mm. And I remember that outhouse cause, oh boy, I was so scared mm. at night. So, Then the Russians came, mm. meaning the progression of the fighting had come close and they were coming and they were, we are being evacuated, they are evacuating the area. My brother is eight or nine years old or something like that. I'm in my early teens. Mm -hmm. My parents had gotten all of their belongings from Frankfurt to there. Now my father is with a shovel digging a huge hole to put all of his belongings into the hole because the Russians are coming. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And we have to leave. Mm. So they take some sort of a bedspread type deal, sew it together, make it a rucksack for my mother on her back. Mm. Mind you, she is in a body cast with her arm cast like that mm -hmm. okay and we have to flee <coughs> there's no train hmm. the last one there is is a freight train open freight cars and we're in there and it's january in the january beginning of february Easter Germany, it's freezing. And there we are in that open train. And I climbed up to see out and as far as the eye can see, there are people walking away with carts and wagons and animals, whatever you can think of as far as the eye can see, people running away to nowhere. Mm. Nobody knows where they're going, only running away from what's coming. Mm -hmm. And unless you experience that, you cannot possibly imagine what that's like. That's, you cannot. You got to experience that because the kind of fear that is with that, you can't explain to anybody. You don't know what's coming, where you're going, or if you're even going to live. Mm -hmm. So we are in that train, in that car. <laughs> mind you, mind you, there's no food, there's no water. And then no bathroom is, there's no bathroom either for that matter, mm -hmm. okay? So, so the whole thing you you call, you call that sort of have to imagine, and there is this very very old man, and he dies, mm -hmm. and the women pick pick him up and throw him over. What are they going to do with the corpse? Know, right. Okay. So the women tap him, 
And I remember, these are some of the things I really vividly remember. Because it's awful. So, eventually this train gets to La Marche in Thuringia. And Lomach can't take anybody anymore. Yeah. And then it goes to Meissen. And Meissen can't take anybody anymore. So it keeps going between Lomach and Meissen. Eventually it stops in one of them. I can't remember which one. I think it was Lomach. In any case, there was somebody who had coffee. Yeah. And we got out of the train into a schoolhouse and there was straw on the floor and there were hundreds of people mm. and I remember needing to go to a bathroom and of course <laughs> whatever was there it was all pee all over the place yeah. needless to say I mean at that point in time um, and my mother was having this awful cough and somebody came and took my mother away from my brother and me. Wow. So, here my brother and I are in the middle of nowhere in this school, whatever. I guess it was a gym. And... And you guys are alone. Huh? You guys are alone. Yes. My goodness. There we were. Yeah. And they thought my mother made me have TB mm. because of the cough. So they brought her back in the morning. I don't know what they did with her. I, you know, but it, apparently she, they were, they were okay with her to be back with us. Mind you, still, she is in this full cast. So she takes my brother and me to get away from there, and we start walking into town. There's a bakery, the window open. And she looks at me, and she with her one arm, shoves me, helps me on up, and climb through the window and steal a loaf of bread. Mm -hmm. So here now we had something to eat. That was the first we had eaten in God knows how long. And uh, didn't get caught. And she, with that rucksack on her back, and my brother is carrying two pillows Parade kisser. Oh God. <laughs> That's funny and not funny. Those, they were special pillows that were used specifically when a bed was being made. And they were the prime example of beauty or whatever used. And my mother was adamant that he carry those idiotic pillows why I will never understand in any case he griped <laughs> he's a little kid he's hungry he's dirty he's thirsty you know and I'm older so now he wants me to take care of everything I can't and my mother is in a cast she can't do anything so She gets to the station and there is a train and what my mother is trying to do is get herself and her two kids to Turinga. We have no idea what happened to my father at this point in time. He had co completely disappeared. We had no idea where he was, if he was alive or not, okay? 
So my mother is adamant to get us to her sisters in Thuringen at this point in time. And we find this train and there are these people, everybody is now running, you know, so we don't know who they are, where they're from, and they keep singing, they eat onions. Mm. <laughs> they, they had a sack or whatever full of onions, the only thing they had, and they were eating them. <laughs> don't laugh because I don't, I can't stand onions to start with. <laughs> but. That was apparently the only food they had. Yep, what are you going to do? And uh, they were singing this In der Heimat, in der Heimat, da gibt's ein wieder, wieder, wieder sein. I mean, on and on and on. And what it means at home, at home, we shall meet again. Oh. Mm. So we got to Turinger in that train. And my mother's sister's daughter was working in, I can't remember the town's name mm -hmm. at this point. So when we got off of that train, how my mother knew, or if, she, I don't know how, but she went to that store. And with that, we then went to her sister's house, walking. And we walked for like maybe a half an hour or so, and a farmer came by with a wagon, and we wound up on the wagon with the horse-drawn wagon, and we went for another half hour or so before we got to her sister's house. And there we stayed a few days, a week maybe, whatever. Hmm. But my mother decided to leave my brother there and take me back to Frankfurt. Hmm. Now she wants to get home. Well. Because of the way things were, my mother's friend in Frankfurt, in the city center, was bombed out. So my parents allowed them to use their apartment so this way they wouldn't lose it. Hmm. Okay or somebody was living there, mm -hmm. so they didn't lose it. So my mother was determined to get me back to her apartment. Mm -hmm. And I cannot remember what happened to her friend and her husband. I, I, I have no recollection on how that one worked, how my mother got rid of him or whatever. So, in any case, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to go back to school and to the war. Okay. We, I mean, we never were out of the war, right. <laughs> really, but our school, with the bombings that occurred on a continued basis now, our school got hit. Mm. And when they let us out of the cellar... Uh, the bomb shelter? Yeah. Luftschutzkeller. What do you say, bomb shelter? Okay, yep. that's good. We kids ran, needless to say. Okay, we 
trampled each other to death, literally. Physically, literally, you know, trying. If somebody fell down, that's tough shit. <laughs> Sorry about that, you know, you go. You, you don't have time to think. All you have time for is trying to survive. And that is, again, you got to experience that in, in order to understand it. Soldiers understand that. If you were in the service? No. <laughs> you? No, ma'am. So if you're, if you're in that situation, then you'll understand. But mm -hmm. that survival is the number one feeling in your body. It's, you, do not think. There's no conscious thought process, which is sort of very interesting, mm -hmm. you know. So, we, we got out, you know, through the glass and the bombs and the fire and the burnings and the everything. And during one attack, we, we were um, Eschenheimer tour and we wound up in, in a basement there and during this attack, they brought a woman down the cellar stairs who had, who had broken open and part of her intestinal drag, mm -hmm. drain yeah. was dragged behind her, you know, as they dragged her down the stairs. I remember that. She was dead. I mean, it was a corpse. Mm -hmm. uh, she got caught while she was still outside. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'll always remember that, the way they dragged that corpse mm -hmm. down the stairs and the half of the gut dragon behind her. Mm -hmm. uh, air raids. Is something you get to experience the whole beauty of it. Hmm. When when the alert sirens blew, you know, you went to shelter, you know. And my father and I would go into our backyard and we would look in the sky at night mm. to see the plane. And, and if there was a full moon, if there was light, could see the formation of the planes, you know, and they were like this. They were always, mm -hmm. but the, the whole formation was in a triangular and they would drop the bombs. The first would drop and the next one would drop and the next one would drop, you know, and we could watch because we were at the outskirts of, of the city, so we could watch. Mm. Unless it hit us, you know, that was a different story. <laughs> when, when it came close enough, we'd get hide. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, when you saw these bombs dropping, and you're a, a young woman, a, a teenager, a girl. Yes. I mean, in, in, in you're being evacuated, you're on trains, you're being moved around. Basically, all the trappings of civilization was collapsing. It wasn't there. Yeah, so how, how, did, how did you process that as a girl? You don't. Yeah. Because you don't think. Hmm. I told you, survive. Hmm. And that is the only thing that matters at that point. Mm -hmm. You don't think about tomorrow, yesteryear, or whatever. Right now is the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. Right now, this moment is how you survive. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else there. And you got to experience that to truly get the feeling how that works. You know. Yeah. Uh, so, 
with all of the bombings and everything and you know and the evacuation da 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 so now the russians are coming and we are trying to get back and we are back in Turinga and my mother is taking me and we are going back to Frankfurt and as I said I don't I can't remember about her friend in our apartment how she got rid of her or what they did uh, but my mother is determined to get us back mm -hmm. so here she is in the cast here I am and she still has her rucksack. She's taking that with her no matter what. <laughs> she, we leave my brother at her sister's. And she and I, we are now going to the train station and we are getting a train to Frankfurt. However, at this particular point in time, there is no normal traffic anymore of anything. I mean, everything is collapsing. So there is this train, it starts, she shoves me in and she goes in and there is this lieutenant or whatever. He tells my mother, you can't, this is a train for injured servicemen. Mm. And my mother with her cast, I what the hell do you think this is? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and yes, they let her because yes, this was a war injury. And that's how we got back to Frankfurt. We have no food, no water, no power. What we have is ourselves. It's still winter time. It's cold too. So we break whatever we can break to make fire. So in any case, at one point she's in the living room. I don't know what she was doing. I was in the kitchen and she calls. And I went, and she takes her pants off, and in the pants is a fetus. Mm. I will never, ever forget. It was about this big. One leg was reversed. It was, instead of going down, it was going up. And it was male. So I took this little thing and put it in a wash bowl. And I didn't know what to do, and I told her I'm going to get the doctor. Well, Dr. von der Heiden was an old man at the time. He was in, not in the service, and he was in his house. And he came, and he looked at her, and he said, he'll be back. And he came back with a bag, and he put her on the kitchen table, and he did DNC in the kitchen. Oh, my goodness because there was no afterbirth. Mm -hmm. There was nothing. So he did a DNC in the kitchen on the kitchen table. And the blood went into the bucket. And then she got in and then she got the infection. Okay. And the fever is sky high within a day. And I'm running around the street, you know, trying to find some help and did and uh, one of the neighbors an old man he tried to get the hospital and how they managed to do all that I really can't remember but eventually they came with an ambulance and took my mother to the hospital. And now I am alone. 
And again, no food, no water, no nothing, okay? And I got to walk to the hospital every day and home. And I did. And that was maybe a two hour walk, two and a half hours, something like that. So five, six hours a day was shot just walking. And one morning, one day, on my way I collapsed. And this woman found me and took me to her apartment. And of course I came too, you know, I'm young. And she gave me a piece of bread. And I will never forget, she shared a piece of bread. Hmm. And one day, there's a knock on the back door, open the back door and there's my father. And hello there. <laughs> so, he tries to procure all kinds of things. One of the most important is food. Mm -hmm. I can't remember how many raw apples I stole from the trees when they were this big, you know, but interestingly enough, you, I did not get sick. Because hmm. the, the adults will take you, you can't eat, that, that'll make you sick, it's not ripe yet, and all of this garbage. Hmm. I was hungry, I ate what I could find, or steal for that matter, and guess what? Never got sick. It always worked. Mm -hmm. So the body is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know. Um, so, in any case, here's my father back home. And is this uh, back in Frankfurt now? Yeah. Did you ever find what what where was he during this time? What happened to him? Yes, I found out. Oh, okay. Um, when the Russians came, they gave every civilian a rifle. Oh. <laughs> oh. With or without munition that would fit. Who knew what, okay? And uh, my father really was not a, not a, a soldier, but they gave him a rifle anyways, and he ran. And uh, apparently he wound up in Hamburg. And went f and flow, flee, he fleed. Uh, he said he would walk during the night in the forests and hide and sleep during the day. Hmm. And in villages he would work for the women for food. Hmm. And he made it back to Frankfurt that way. And that was one of the things he did. The first thing was bicycle to the nearest villages to procure some food, an egg, a piece of bread, whatever, okay? And he then went to see my mother, needless to say, and uh, there were two nurses there in the hospital who did transfusions. They gave their blood to my mother. Wow. So the transfusions were person to person, wow. two nurses. Hmm. Who's, and they became best friends for thereafter, you know, da, 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 da. Erika and Ilse, I'll never forget them either. Hmm. So in any case, the uh, fact that they s saved her life is a miracle in the first place. Um, 
Whatever happened to that fetus, I'll never know because I had put it in the wash basin. I suppose my pa my father must have buried it eventually. Yeah. yeah. So uh, after he was there, then he would procure food and what have you. Um, the Americans came. We got back to Frankfurt towards that very end. There were still bombings, but like maybe two, three weeks. And then it stopped. And then the troops start marching in. And the first Americans I saw was a company of black men. Mm -hmm. I'm a kid. I had no idea what a black man is. Mm -hmm. These people are marching with rifles and they are marching over here with the rifle point this way, and those walking over here are pointing the rifle this way. And they're brown. Mm -hmm. They're not black. They're brown. Sure. Their skin is brown. Mm -hmm. And it's not all the same shade. Mm -hmm. They are lighter and darker and really dark and real light and really dark. And I'm at that bedroom window and I'm looking out and I'm seeing that and I'm scared shitless, excuse yeah. my language. <laughs> hey, yeah. what do you expect? Yeah, of course. What we had been taught in school, my imagination was of people other than Germans mm -hmm. to be like Martians. Mm -hmm. What we see on TV about foreigners, aliens. Okay, that's what my mind was telling me about British, American, and French. So now these Americans are black. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> Choo! <laughs> that brain of mine is turning in every direction. Can you imagine? So did you think at that point? Maybe the things they were teaching me, I mean, were true because precisely you're seeing precisely people look much different than what you've been used to. Exactly, you know, I'm not sure now. What am I seeing? Yeah, and where we were living, there was a border between the next village and us, right there. So one of our stores was there and the border was there. And there would be soldiers that, I can't remember now the name, what you call them, uh, guards. Mm. Okay, American guards. Now, I'd been to high school and had English. Mm -hmm. So I could have conversations with these guys. Yeah. Of course it was, the English wasn't as well as good as it is now, but it was English mm -hmm. and I could understand what they were saying to the most part. Okay, so I could procure some food. So I got some sea rations mm -hmm. this way. So I could hide the sea rations in my bed. And when everybody was, when my mother was asleep, my father was asleep, I could grab the sea rations and have something to eat. Oh boy, man, that was, that was neat. <laughs> <laughs> At this point in time, of course, there's no school. So at this point, had the war ended yet and it, you were occupied or was the war still going on? It was still going on. Okay. The Americans were now there. Yeah. So for me, there was no war mm -hmm. because at this particular point in time, they were still fighting in Berlin, but Frankfurt was okay. 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 Um,
going back in time. And Adolf, at age 10, all children became militarized. For the boys, it was Jungfolk. And for the girls, it was Jungmädel and at 14, Baby M. So at 10, Jungmädel. For boys at 10, Pimpf. And for girls at 14, Baby M, Punto Jemejin. And for boys at 14, Jungfolk. So all children, regardless of gender, were trained at starting at age 10. And this is really very, very important because on TV, you always see boys. Mm -hmm. You see young folk. The girls too. And at 18, they all went into Reichsarbeitsdienst, which was the workforce. So from age 10, you were being governed 100% by the Reich. And from 18 was uh, in, the, in the workforce and from then on into the military, you know. And for the girls, and this is very important, they were to become mothers. If you remember right, you may have heard it before, that there were the girls that had babies. And that was part of the training. The idea was, you are female, you are made to have babies, and he would select the men that would father those children that had nothing to do with love. Hmm. It had to do with reproduction. Mm -hmm. There are two different things here. And that, again, I think for an American that is pretty difficult to even conceive. Yes. Okay? But that's the way it worked. So when you're 18 years old, female, you probably had a choice. You could either spread your legs mm -hmm. or, or you become military. Mm -hmm. You know, there, is, there were the two things you could do. Mm -hmm. And I remember girls writing to Mama how wonderful it was to become a mother for Adolf. Because the training was there. And this is something that you have to remember. It started at age 10. It didn't start late. It started early, when that mind was pretty ripe, ready to learn, and he trained it. So prior to age 10, what was the education system like for a, a five, six, seven year old? You know, why did they choose 10 years old to start the indoctrination essentially? No, the indoctrination started in school with age six. Ah, okay. The, the indoctrination started the soon you started with the first grade. Okay, with the history classes and things like with that. With everything, yeah. okay. So the actual indoctrination was right there. But at age 10, then, you became a member of the organization. Mm -hmm. Because then you couldn't be at home anymore with mom and dad. You had to go to the meetings and you were being indoctrinated at the meetings. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's something that I think I didn't emphasize enough. Becoming, becoming a Hitler youth was 100% indoctrination and training, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Hmm. We had a girl in our class who got a beating from her father while she was wearing the uniform 
she reported him and he wound up in a concentration camp. Mm. Because, not because he hit his child. She was wearing the uniform and at that point it was against the state. Mm. His movement was against the state. So the state literally took over your future, your bodies, the your your freedom of choice for what you're going to do the going forward. The state took you over. Yeah, period. the whole thing. Yes, and because they started the training so early, you had no idea that was happening. That was just a normal thing. Exactly, and people who were old enough to understand, could do one of two things, keep the mouth shut or get killed. Mm. Yeah. There was no choice in the matter. And this is something that they don't understand out there. There was no choice, none. Radios what you can listen to on the radio was pre-programmed by the government. So you couldn't get the news from Great Britain. You couldn't get the news from France. Okay? So that is a total different concept even. Th that's even worse than what the Russians are doing. Okay? Um, Every move people made was controlled. Interesting. The organization, you know, like a mayor. In the villages, they all have, you know, who runs things, okay? The first thing Adolf did was make sure he gets his people into these positions. And that started, that must have started at, as he got in, it must have been in the very early 30s, you know, 31, 32, 33, with these changes already being made and manifest. So that people as a whole in general hadn't any idea what the hell was going on. And in any population, anywhere, there's always a segment of the population that'll do anything for either food, money or both. They don't give a shit one way or the other as long as they get, you know, to say, you know what I mean? I do. This is that particular segment of the population that he got into, that he took, controlled, and used. So before before anybody knew it, you know, you couldn't you couldn't even look over your shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh, next door to us, two houses down was was a family their name was Geisler and the man made couches at home he made couches for, he, he, okay he hand made couches for people okay okay they would order and he would make okay and he was a nice guy and his daughter the Kustel had had polio when she was a girl and one of the, one of her legs did not grow with the other one. You know, she had polio. So he was a real nice guy. And I'd come out, good morning, Herr Geisler, you know, da, da, da. And one morning I came out and he looked at me and he said, it's Heil Hitler. Hmm. No more good Morgan. Huh. So 
that was one of the things that I, I remember very clearly how distinct that was. Um, and it was not that he was politically involved in any way, shape or form. He had his business. And if he wanted his business to succeed, if he wanted to eat, then he better teach the kid next door how to say Heil Hitler. Whether you believe it or not makes no difference. Right. Okay? Yes. So, to, to understand some of this, this is where it all goes to, is survival in the first place. The farmers did the same thing. Hmm. If they wanted to get the, the seed, they'd have to go to the store and they couldn't say, hi, how are we doing this morning? It had to be Heil Hitler. And if the farmer didn't say he's Heil Hitler, he didn't get the seed. Oh, my. So it is not as easy to understand for, for the American society because it was all so small to start. Hmm. It was just this little step at a time. And unfortunately, what I see nowadays is an exact rerun. Yeah. I'm sorry to say, but that's what I see is a rerun and I'm scared. Mm -hmm. I really am. Mm -hmm. And again, what you have is a lot of uneducated asses, excuse my language, and that's exactly what they are. That go with a hail you, because that way they eat, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but oh, I get very angry when I see what's going on. It's incremental. It's, it's little steps, like you're saying. Exactly. One at a time, mm -hmm. you know, and nobody sees what is going to come next. <sighs> mm. Oh, I shouldn't have gone into today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you could, you can, you, I've noticed even whenever I was growing up in high school, history, U.S. history, there was a, just a very little bit about World War II in there. And it has gotten, I think, worse and worse. It's gotten more and more marginalized because there was huge lessons to be learned from that era of history. That's part of why Tony and I are doing this. Interesting, interestingly enough, American history in schools, from what I've gotten over the few years I've been here, 60 years or whatever, does not really teach history. It teaches, depending on the state, what the politician at that moment decides is beneficial. But you, as history as a whole, nobody teaches, nowhere. And when I first came to America, that was one of the things I did, go to the libraries and read. And that was, oh, interesting. Oh, oh, I loved it. <laughs> the, uh, the, I'm not politically inclined in any way, shape or form in reality, but I do get very upset when I see all of the bullshit that's going on and people fall for it. Yeah. That really bothers me a lot. Cause, and again, a lot of times it's the income that makes the decision, mm -hmm. which is sort of very interesting. Mm -hmm. If I do this, I'll get more and I can buy this. And if I can buy this, I can have da, 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 da. Yeah. So it, to me, I mean, obviously you're maintaining your livelihood and your money is an important thing. But the other thing I've noticed politically in the United States, and it sounds like it may have happened in Germany, is was, was some of the um, acceptance for the Nazi regime associated with also being socially acceptable, that you didn't want to be that person that stuck out, 
or that went against the state, just like, that, like, 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 you know, the mass now has turned political. Right. That I can answer because I was too young ah, gotcha. to understand that point. <clears throat> yeah. You know, I can't answer that one. Yeah. But what I do know is that the people in the neighborhood did as they were told mm -hmm. because that was the easiest way to get along, to make the living, to get that piece of bread. Yeah. Nobody wanted to wind up dead yeah. and nobody either wanted to wind up on the Eastern Front. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, so I mean, can we ask a few questions real quick here? Um, question number one was, when you uh, were in Silesia and you were in Eastern Germany and the Russians were coming, were they close enough that you could, you could hear the fighting? Yes. What was, what was that like? Do you, as a, as a girl and you're hearing this, it must've been frightening. It sounded like fireworks. Huh. And that's why I do not see go to fireworks. I can't handle it. Mm. That's what it sounds like. The explosions, mm. the shooting. Okay? And it comes closer. So you know you have to run. Mm. Was there, was it pretty widely known at that point, at your age, about how the Russians were treating civilians when no. they made it? Okay. There was nothing known about the Russians. Anything they did came out after. Okay, got it. After they did it, whatever it is they did. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's of interest, in, in, of interest to me, actually, with the breakdown, in Germany were a lot of people from Czechoslovakia, Poland, whenever, forced labor. Mm -hmm. Okay? When the Americans came, they let these people out. The first thing these people did was rape. The girl across the street from us were 12 or 13 guys over her. Which is interesting, in a way. Because they, men use sex as a weapon which is sort of very interesting to think about it mm. because that's not what it was designed. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> it was reproduction. Right. Uh, right. You know, so, and if you go to the East, you see now it's still the same way. They still do the same thing. Mm. Mm. Women are being used as an object. And that is sort of very interesting, but that's a different story altogether. You know, that has nothing to do with World War II. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And what about when the Americans uh, occupied Frankfurt and you were there? Um, what was the relationship like after the initial shock of seeing the black soldiers come in? What was the relationship like between the civilians and the American soldiers who occupied Frankfurt? <laughs> uh -oh. Okay, <laughs> what you have is a force of males Correct. who come into a town with females. I give you three guesses what happens. <laughs> they ended up getting together. You got that right. right. Was it? And the important part now on that one is 
sex part, food and cigarettes. If you got cigarettes, you could get food. And what would get cigarettes is sex. Mm. Okay? Money was of no concern whatsoever. Again, that is something that doesn't understand. You know, hmm. it's it's a weapon. It really is. Yeah. And I had one neighbor. She'd have the, she'd get the cigarettes. And she'd let me have some of the cigarettes, and I'd sell the cigarettes. Well, and get food. And I'd get a bread. Yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, uh, I've read somewhere that sex is the oldest financial transaction in, in human the, history. It is. Yeah. And it will remain the same. Yeah. You, you know, that will never change. Yeah. Um, and that brings another thing to mind. And that has nothing to do with the war now. Mm -hmm. It has to do with abortion. Mm -hmm. And that is something that was here, that will always be here and will never go away. And the problem, the sorrow about this is, we now have all the medications possible so that fertilization does not occur in the first place. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if the idiots thought for a minute yeah they wouldn't get pregnant in the first place yeah it can be prevented now yes totally it's safely exactly yeah. you know so you don't have to kill a fetus it's not necessary i agree so so much for that no it's so good. i have a question when your family was trying when your mother had the rucksack and your brother was carrying the pillows and you were going to norway is that correct no did you, did you say you said norway earlier I must have no okay what town were you going to where you left your brother? Where you know how you left your mother left your brother? In Thuringia. Okay. Where where in was in Rudolstadt, I think. Okay. So is that closer to the eastern front or was it closer to the western front? Middle. Okay. Where was It became east. Okay. So when then you guys went back to Frankfurt, was there a conscious decision there to get closer to the American forces as they were pushing in? So you wouldn't no. be part no. of the Eastern forces? No, Okay. that had nothing to do with it. Okay. All that had to do with it to get to where we lived. To get okay. home. To get home. How, what happened with your brother? We left him in Turing. And eventually my father went to get him. Okay. Uh, he had to go, oh, that's another story altogether. All right. <laughs> when when my father went to get my brother that was after after my mother was back out of the hospital and he decided he wanted his family together again so he, he went and from what I understand he got into the east zone through the woods at night and that's the same way they got out of the east zone was through the woods at night mm. um i can't really remember exactly how he did it because it never was of much interest to me how he did it really I didn't like my brother mm. <laughs> at that point in time because he was younger he got everything and I did not yeah he, he was he was f five years younger than me yeah. you, you know so hello there of course he would get every, yeah. <laughs> everything but I was uh, at that point not old enough to understand that one mm -hmm. I, they, I, they needed your help as a young woman at that point yeah they need yeah so but that's neither here nor there, that is just dumb, you know, for me. He, poor guy, he died of lung cancer. Oh. So. So your dad had, this would, this would have been after the war, he would have had to go into the Russian occupied zone to get your brothers, what Correct. you're saying. Correct. Again, like I said, at night and the woods. Woods are always handy. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Unless your outhouse is by them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all right. Oh. You didn't like that. <laughs> no, I didn't. I don't blame you. Oh, God. No. So how did you end up in America? How did, how did that happen? How did you go from uh, post-war Germany, a uh, young girl surviving that, to, to being in here? I made a GI. Oh, okay. So you were a war bride? Yeah. Oh, okay. Do you feel comfortable talking about that? I think that's cool. Okay, maybe it's not. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't feel comfortable talking about it, it's fine, but. He turned out to be a wife beater. Oh, dear oh, Lord. Oh, geez, okay. I'm sorry about that. Don't be sorry. That's the way we were live close. Yeah. Okay. So one fine day, I had enough gumption to stand up. I was cutting meat. He came in. I knew, oops. And I went like this, one step closer. It goes through the gut, all the way down the back. Oh, jeez. He was six foot three, 235 pounds. And you're not. I was 98 pounds at the time. He didn't about turn and ran and never came back. Wow. Good for you. Wow. Actually, just in this short time I've gotten to know you, I'm really not surprised that you did that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised I waited so long. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm not surprised that he turned around and never came back. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I think about that, I find, this, I find it very interesting. Mm -hmm. Because psychologically, he was very undeveloped, I think. Hmm. Um, I came at that particular point in time, I came from destruction. And he was the light for a good future. Sure. Yes. A way that it didn't turn out that way, such is life. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's, it's neither here nor there. That's the way it works. It works sometimes. And uh, I was fortunate enough to survive that, survive that, survive him, and I'm here, and I'm still around. That's right. <laughs> Fair enough. So I can't complain. Um, when here you are in your formative years, from a young girl to a young woman, what witnessing the collapse of the only world you knew how did how has that affected you throughout the rest of your life how could you i mean has that has that always created a certain degree of insecurity no gratitude i mean what how how have you been able how has that affected you as you've gotten older i do not believe in any government I look at it, I watch TV, I see what happens, and they're all crooks to me, no matter where I go and how I look, period. Okay? That's number one. Yeah. I do not believe in any promises by anybody in any position up there. To me, that's all big words. It means nothing. Yeah. I listen to it, you know, and then I see what happens. Hello there. Okay? And all I see is repetition. Mm. And that's one of the things that's of interest to me, is the repetition. And I go back to history, and I go to the Egyptians, and I go to the Russians, and I go to South America, and it's always the same thing. It never, ever changes. Mm. One ass with big ears makes it, he subdues whatever is under him until he dies or gets killed. Mm -hmm. And then we start all over again. It never, ever changes. 
populations as a whole do not learn. There's not a collective memory. It's it's like we for people America or people in general want to want to believe the best the the things that are promised and they forget the worst. And, and, it seems and it's not ta it's not perpetuated and taught. No. In school with history. No. Yeah. It, it, no. Yeah. And even if it's taught in history, it's still past tense. Yeah. Like, oh, that was then. We can do it better now. Right. Yeah. Not only are we doing better, we are better. We are better. We've learned so much. We'll, <laughs> this is now. This we'll, is now. You guys, that was then. you guys, excuse my language, but it's all shit from Trinola. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. It's really true. Yeah. Throughout history, there is continuous repetition. And what we always have is somebody, generally it's, it's a group. And whatever they have, they can convince the others to do their bidding. Mm -hmm. And you can see it in the schoolyard with a preschooler and the regular school and you go watch and you always will have this group of kids around this one person. Mm, that's true. Yeah. Okay, yep. and you will always have this one person to get two or three who will follow and then they become this group and they will control a whole bunch. And you have that particular kind of ability that is there and will never go away in the population across the board. Yeah. And the way we live today, it's money. Well, control and money, power, control, power, money, power, control, control, control. Politicians. Mm -hmm. Right. And and they can keep promising because they'll get voted out eventually and they just kick that can down the road. Exactly. And they don't have to deal with the consequences eventually. No. No. They go into retirement and get paid for it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what can I tell you? Yeah. Yeah. That's the American way. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go into the Far East, <laughs> they kill them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. but, but you're right, though. The common theme seems to be that, that populations, regardless of what form of governance they have, populations continue to allow themselves to be made small by the government. Okay. Now, there is a reason for this. Hmm. The first thing you need, A, is food. Mm -hmm. Second one is housing. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. You'll do anything for food. Yeah. You'll do most anything for housing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So right now I already got you. If you want to eat, you're going to do my bidding. Mm -hmm. It's easy. Yeah. It's real easy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't think of it that way. Because here you can just... Nowadays, income is such that people just go to the store and buy. And if their income isn't high enough, the government gives them the allocation mm -hmm. so they can still go to the store and get what they think they need. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily what they do need. It's what they think they need. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. <laughs> okay? So, you govern that. Go into any store, and I don't mean regular stores, I mean grocery stores, mm -hmm. to any store in the nation, mm -hmm. and you govern how people can get their food, guess what? You have control. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're not. So, yeah. so 
it's it's so easy if you think about it mm -hmm. and so far away from anybody's thought mm -hmm. nobody ever thinks in those terms mm -hmm. Well, I think the other thing that you, if you, you've experienced that I, I find really fascinating and frightening is I think, um, I think humans have gotten to the point where they take this for granted, uh, the water, the lights, the trappings of civilization. I don't think a lot of people realize how, how fragile that is and how much of an anomaly the way we've lived, say, the last 150 years is. You saw all that fall apart. You experienced that. Politically. Yeah. But now we're having Mama Nature come into the picture. Yeah. Yeah. We are having nature coming in. And with the storms worldwide, mm -hmm. there are a lot of people losing everything mm -hmm. just by a storm. Mm -hmm. Hello. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's another. So this is a different aspect of it all. Yeah. You know. But that's nature. Yeah. And the other I come from was man-made. So there is an enormous difference of the two. Yeah. yeah. So um, we've taken up a lot of your time. That's nice. I've really enjoyed speaking with you, but is there anything else that you'd like to share that we haven't had a chance to touch on um, thus far? Is there anything additional that, um, that, that we haven't uh, had a chance to discuss that you'd like to bring up? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, well, after the war, of course, everything is bombed out. Okay, yeah. Okay. So needless to say, you have to think in terms of the bombings. Hmm. You hear the swish of the falling bomb. We don't know exactly where it's going to hit, but by the sound, you know whether it's close or further away. Hmm. Okay. Um, they dropped what we call Brandbomben, which were bombs that ignited during the falling, so they came down as fire. Hmm. So this way, the fire was initiated immediately. Hmm. Okay, so everything was burned. You really have to live through that. To even get a glimpse of what your feelings are. Hmm. Be because when you run through the heat and the smell and the broken glass, at the swishing of the bombs and the explosions. Hmm. You don't think. Your brain does not work the way it normally does. All it wants for you is to survive whatever way you can. You know, so, and it does not compare with a soldier, with, with a soldier in battle, he's in battle, he doesn't know whether or not he's going to get hit. But he's not running. He is advancing and he's shooting, okay? And he's got a mindset of getting that enemy. In this case, in those bombings, you don't have any of that. Yeah, you're, you're just, just make it it's, a, it's a different ball game altogether, you know. And, and like us at that age, having had the training and your high DMC get grants, okay, there is just no way of telling anybody how you feel. 
Because at this point, I didn't even know myself. Mm. You know, was Hitler, did he have anything to do with that? Of course not, mm. from what we are being told in the news, what's, what we've been told in school. You know, it's all the others mm. that do that to us. We had nothing to do with that. You see what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm, I do. We are being persecuted for nothing at all. I mean, so the whole schmear is one big fat lie, which I went, I have gone back to Germany since I've been here. And I had one friend and she, she and I went to school together. We were. She was one of the girls selected with me for the higher education and all of that. And uh, she never got a hundred percent away from uh, the initial teachings. Oh no, thank you. Thanks for offering, sir. So she was still. She still had some of that inculcation she still had to, had that with her well i still do okay we we you don't get away from it you know because my approach to everything is still a very direct short mm -hmm. sharp you know you just don't ever get away from that mm. uh, you don't get ever smooth and sweet <laughs> I don't. I don't think that was ever my style in the first place. But so, uh, so some of it will stay, you know. But I remember Elfriede wasn't sure whether or not some of the teachings were correct, mm -hmm. and some of them were correct. Mm -hmm. Some of them were right, mm -hmm. if you look into history, because the. It's always repetitious, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah, in that sense, some of it was right, yeah. And altogether, if it hadn't been the involvement of Great Britain and the United States, then Hitler's name wouldn't be on the news all the time either. Yeah. Let's say if Brazil had been in the mess, it'd be forgotten by now. Okay? Yeah. So, China, Brazil, mm -hmm. and Russia today are all in the same bootstraps, so to speak, mm. that Germany was under Hitler. Mm. The people get their food and shut up. Yeah. Okay? What was the Brazilian guy? He didn't want the vaccination because it's unnecessary. Yeah. yeah. Okay? Yeah. So the people die, who cares? Mm -hmm. Did anybody of the Northern or Western Hemisphere go down there and tell them, hey, you can't do that? No. No, of course not. Right. You know, everybody has a big mouth, but nobody does anything. You know? Yeah. And the population always is big enough. It doesn't matter whether a few hundred die or not. Yeah. It's, you know, so. What about, you know, something I didn't ask you is, do you remember how you found out that the war ended and how did you feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you brought up one. Okay. <laughs> I can't remember how we heard the war ended. Okay. But I do remember my mother had to be denazified. Oh. 
Oh yeah, because she is, remember I told you, and in the beginning with the stole, she had to be in the party in order for her to have the stole. Okay, so now because of that, the, the, the Americans came up with the idea, Entnazifizierung. Mm -hmm. Listen to that word, mm -hmm. Entnazifizierung. That's denazify the population. <laughs> so what, what did that entail? Huh? What did that entail? They have to go watch like movies and stuff? What did they have to do? Oh, they they had to go and and swear that they were not going to be a Nazi anymore. <laughs> That's it. That's that was it. it. Uh, what what are you going to do with the population? Uh, yeah. Okay. You know. So yeah, yeah. I remember that was funny. I think that's funny now. That's ridiculous. I, I think end, it's pretty ridiculous now. In the hindsight. end Nazifizierung, yeah, of the right. of the uh, population. They had to swear that they're not going to be Nazi anymore. What so, a bunch of bull. <laughs> ay, 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 give so, me a break. So one question I have is you talked about the first teacher that you had would start off the day with a prayer and yes, everything. Yes. And then she was gone and, yes. and he had the Heil Hitler teacher come yes. in. At, after that point, was religion completely taken out of the vernacular, out of, out of, I mean, it was yes. only the government then? Yes. Okay. Yes. Absolute. We had religion in school. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting, very interesting. We, it was the religions of the centuries and the world. Mm. So it was not Jesus Christ superstar. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was the religions and that was and still is very interesting and i get on the computer and i'll still do that hmm. because there are so many mm -hmm. different beliefs mm -hmm. and uh, that's i find that very interesting mm -hmm. so uh but that was that yeah i like i like that one mm -hmm. a lot oh yes and with that of course comes my confirmation um, Protestant? Uh, yeah, grew up Catholic and now Protestant. Uh, well, in America, you don't have just Protestants. You have a lot of them, right. You have all of those different denominations, you know. Yeah. In Germany, all you have is Protestant. It's or Jerusalem. Catholic. <laughs> right. Okay. So, uh, as Protestant. Mm -hmm. So now the war is over. Mm -hmm. So now you truly is going to have to keep, be confirmed. Mm. <laughs> so I go see the lectures at the ministry. So he talks a lot. So I ask a lot of questions to which he has no answers. Mm. He says, the Bible says, I don't want to know that. I can read. Hello there. I want an answer. Okay. You tell me the Garden of Eden. What is the Garden of Eden? Well, it's the Garden of Eden. Hello there. What's the location? <laughs> where is it? Right. Well, it is where? Between Mars and Jupiter? <laughs> Hello there. So nobody can give me answers. Yeah. I want to know. Yeah. But we don't know. No. We believe. Mm -hmm. We believe somebody came up with an idea. Mm -hmm. Well, there are lots of people that came up with ideas. And that was of interest. It's still of interest, you know. Yeah. And again, it's just like the politicians. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Only a different vernacular. Yeah. If you think about it for a minute. Yeah. There's no difference, none whatsoever. Somebody came up with an idea, they wrote a book. Mm. Not one person, one book. Many people over a long period of time mm -hmm. consolidating the writings into one book. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And this is not the only book. There are other books by other people over long periods of time. And their beliefs 
all believes. I believe. I believe. Mm -hmm. I believe. The sun comes up. The sun goes down. The sun is over there. And it's not over there. We have stars in the sky. I can see that. Mm -hmm. Okay? I believe. I know. See it. Mm -hmm. The wind I can feel. I don't have to see it. I can see the leaves blow. Mm -hmm. The branches blow. And I can feel the wind. I don't have to see it. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, but that's something different altogether. Mm -hmm. That has not much to do with Adolf. <laughs> which, to go back into into Adolf, like I said, if a minister or a priest was speaking anything against the regime, they'd get them right off the pulpit. Hmm. Okay? I mean, the Gestapo was in the churches. Mm -hmm. So everybody followed the rules. So in, that's in, of interest again, you know, that is one aspect of religion following the rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. yeah, I mean, did, did you, um, when, when, when the, the Nazi youth program started to take effect when it's more formalized around 10 years old I think you said earlier was there was it just like you would see on TV were there uniforms did you guys go on retreats I mean what sort of activities were they trying to do to kind of inculcate the youth into the idea of the Nazi party okay to start with yes there were uniforms okay okay yes you had I can't remember how many meetings there were mm -hmm per week, mm -hmm. um, you know, two, three hours at a time. Wow. Yes. Okay. We would sing specific songs. Um, Siehst du im Osten das Morgenrot, ein Zeichen zur Freiheit zur Sonne. Do you see the morning red in the east? It's a sign to freedom. Hmm. We hold together whether life or death may come whatever they may. Ma kommen was immer da wolle. Stop with not believing and with the waiting. The time is now. Hört auf mit dem Haaren, hört auf mit dem Haaren, no flick. We still have German blood in our veins. Noch fließt uns deutsches Blut in den Aden, Volk an Square, Volk on to the arms. Volk on take the arms. Okay, songs like that we kept singing. And we were knitting stockings, socks, and gloves, mittens for the soldiers and scarves. Mm us girls, I don't know, the boys, and and they taught us how to shoot. Really? Yeah, I, of course. Huh. I, I mean, that's part of growing up, know how to shoot, how to handle a gun. Right. You know. Well, I, I agree, and, but and I mean, I, I was surprised um, that at that period of history, when there was such a separation between what the female and the male's role was, that at that time, you're saying that the females were also taught the martial arts, how to shoot a gun. Yeah. Oh, I did not know that. I didn't know that. I thought that the female part of the Hitler Youth, and believe me, I'm no expert on this. That's why we're here. I want to understand this better. Had more to do with um, with homemaking and reproduction. But there was also th that element, too, the military element. And preservation, self-preservation. I did not know that. And self-preservation means you've got to be able to fight. I agree. I didn't okay. know that. So that was part of it. Yes. I'll be. So whenever you were going through uh, the Hitler Youth training, you asked a lot of questions, and you said that didn't work out too well. What did you mean by that? With those leaders, you didn't ask any questions. Uh -huh. did None. You... Ever. 
Did you ever? You did as you were told. Okay. Did okay. And that had nothing to do with like being a teacher. Okay. It had to do with like being uh, the major in the army. Yeah. Okay. Your, your lieutenant, your lieutenant came in, you stood in line and you did your deal. Mm -hmm. You know, the, uh, that was all information. Okay. So, like I said, we'd have our meetings and I'd go, we do our Heil DMC Gekrans. And then for us girls, we would be doing, like I said, knitting and sewing for the soldiers. Mm -hmm. While we were being told stories mm -hmm. of war and survival mm -hmm. and being a good citizen and obedience and all of the garbage. Mm -hmm. You with me? Yeah. You know, all of that garbage which I hate to even think about because I was so stupid. So the whole time that you were going through all of this training, you're a pretty strong-minded, independent thinker, obviously. Did you ever find yourself going, hmm, maybe, maybe I'm on board with this? Or no, were you always no, like, no, no, yes, yes, no, Heil Hitler? No, 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 you know? no, 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 none of the things, because none of this was quote-unquote political. All of this was part of the growing up deal. Gotcha. And my, I was reading at home. And my father told me, no matter what, you keep your mouth shut. Mm -hmm. That is the number one thing to survive. You Absolutely. keep your mouth shut. Mm -hmm. And I did. It went in here, it went out there. <laughs> and I survived. Well, thank you. <laughs> I, yeah, I Yeah, I, I think I think we're um gonna let you guys have your house back. Um I I can't tell you how much we appreciate you sharing these experiences with us. I don't think I knew any of this before this conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I, we, we get immersed in the cultural bath of our own American version of what happened. We very rarely are able to hear the perspective from someone like you who was who a was civilian and was there. <laughs> I mean, um, it's, it, Forget, think think yourself back when you were 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Okay. You go to school mm -hmm. and you believe your teacher. Mm -hmm. You really believe your teacher. Okay. So now you are being introduced into a group of others your own age, and you all get to wear uniforms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, that's lots of fun, isn't it? Yeah. You think you're somebody special, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So you start with that to get the idea of how the training went. Yeah. Just think of you as a kid, how you would have followed, okay? And you would have followed because you didn't know any better at that point in time. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything is new, everything is absorbed, everything comes in, okay? And the only thing you know is how to be dependent on someone else at that point. As at a 10-year-old. At that point in time, in order to eat, you got to have mama. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay? She washes your clothes. She makes sure your meals are on the table. And she helps you with your schoolwork. Okay? And that's all she does. Because the outside influence gets to be very strong now. Mm -hmm. And you start, mama, that's not the way it works. The teacher said so and so. <laughs> yeah. 
okay? Yeah. So, and then mama goes to papa and she says, you know, something's going on. And he says, you better keep your mouth shut mm. because we want to eat. Wow. Okay? Don't say anything. Just keep quiet. Hmm. Or else. You know. hmm. And once you live in this kind of an atmosphere, is a total different ball game from so-called freedom. You know? Yeah. That's that's very difficult for an American to understand because you've always been free. Yep. You know, you can use whatever language you want at any given time to anybody and it makes no difference. Yeah. You know. You don't have to go dial DMC get runs. I I agree. And that's why what you shared with us today is, I think, so powerful because I think there um, is a belief amongst Americans that only the Germans, they were uniquely qualified to be duped by someone like Adolf Hitler. But I think what this, what, what I want to try to convey with what you're sharing is We've we've done this over and over again through history. Anyone can do this. Anyone. We are doing it right now. Exactly. You have a section in this country right yes. now that is completely duped. Yep. Yep. And so I think I think that's an important message to be able to convey is don't just look at this, well, if history it happened, it can only happen to them. No, the, no, this, it's happening right now. Yes. Loud and clear. Yeah. And it's very scary. Yeah. Very. Indeed. I agree. And what's more important and interesting is the so-called leader does not have to be a college graduate. Yeah. What the knowledge level is, is of no importance whatsoever. Mm -hmm. yeah. The ability to be powerful in any way, shape or form. Yeah, it's, it, to me and it feels like it's more about charisma. That's it. Than ability. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and you are in any population, no matter where you go, there is always a section of people who will follow the charisma, yep. no matter what it is. They have no brain of their own. They never use their brain. Mm -hmm. They fall for it. They think it's wonderful. And something else I've noticed about people who have charisma is they can make huge mistakes and be forgiven for it. They, oh, yes. they, they can continue to screw things up and oh, people yes. will still follow them because exactly. of that charisma. Exactly. Whereas someone who doesn't have charisma, they'd be, oh, you're not qualified. <laughs> you know, they'd yeah. be pushed off to the side. Exactly. Hmm. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and, um, and wrap this up. We've Good. been here for a couple of hours. You guys have been extremely gracious with yeah, your time. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome, I'm oh, sure. Nice. <laughs> yeah, this has been fantastic. We're, we're going to, in the next couple of months, it'll take a little bit of a while to, to go through this and some of the other things we're doing, make this into a podcast episode. And before we release it, we're going to make sure that you guys can hear it and, and, give, and say, yes, this is okay. You didn't misrepresent it. Okay, let me look at it. Okay. Uh, we so we we and haven't also, we haven't uh, constructed it yet, right? But we can. Um, you guys, do you have access to Google Drive or something like that? I can put it on my Google okay. Drive and send him a link, and he can download from mine. Okay, okay. so we'll do that then yeah. to make sure you get it. it. What I'm trying to say is, is this won't be on our podcast until you have a copy of it first and are okay with it. Okay. Yes. And then also, we will, um, if you'd like, we can put the video on a DVD, like we always do for the VHP sure. people, and, and give you as many copies as you'd like oh, okay. for your yourself, your grandchildren, uh, oh, yeah. your great-granddaughter. you know, Grandchild. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Even a be... raw copy would be good, too. 